think I got this figured out. And I, and I, and I didn't, and I made a lot of mistakes. And the reason why I keep saying mistakes is I want people to know that I'm not this person that's got it all together because nobody does. I think that leaders that are saying they have it all together, it's a false claim because when you want to connect with people, you have to show that you are still trying to figure things out too. I make you talk a lot about success and mindset and business and changes and challenges, but there are some areas I don't know much about. And that was one of those areas. And I had to figure it out. Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Welcome to episode 25 of the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. On today's episode, we are excited to be joined by Adrian Starks discussing leadership. Adrian, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you guys for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. Likewise. Now, obviously, I want to give everybody a chance to uh, to get to know who you are. So we'll start by asking, who is Adrian Stark? Mm, good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a keynote speaker, a best-selling author, and also the CCO of Connect Now. So I work a lot with entrepreneurs and business owners when it comes to the process of change and challenges and how to walk them through that in a step-by-step process. I love seeing people literally create value in their lives by taking on challenges from a different perspective. So I talk a lot about success. I talk a lot about mindset. I talk a lot about um, how do you learn to adjust to the challenges that will come your way. Awesome stuff. And I know we've spoken before about change and I know that's a big part of what you what you like to talk about as well. And again, just looking through some of the some of your writings, some of the blogs that you do, you talk a lot about mindset as well. And you know, there's there's a couple of things. You're learning from your mistakes. Mm-hmm. And I just want to kind of talk about that. I, I know your background a bit, but how is it that you came to this place where you became comfortable with the abilities that you have and kind of branched off from what you were doing? You know, you were in a, a pretty good position. Mm-hmm. Probably a pretty comfortable position. <laughs> and then kind of took the leap to get into this entrepreneurial endeavor. Oh, that's a great question too. So I, I actually come from a family of entrepreneurs. And like most people, I, I got kind of caught in between the two worlds of entrepreneurship and also the world of working. And what I learned about myself in the world of working, the nine to five job was that I was good at it, but I didn't like to be told what to do, or I didn't like to have to follow the rules necessarily. However, I learned a lot about working at a nine to five. So my story is this, I worked in a medical call center for about eight years. Before that, I was a personal trainer and fitness trainer and I got into the medical field when the secession hit. And I was like, oh my goodness, I need to get something more stable because all my clients kind of fell off. They were like, sorry, we like you, but we need to focus on our things. And so I said, okay, what do I do? So I worked at the medical call center and I found myself there the first year, the second year, and then before I knew it, I was there for about eight years. Now, during that process, when I think about it now, the call center, it was actually the calling to the center of my life. When I was in that call center, answering those phone calls every day, it was like over 200 phone calls. You know, I would hear people say, well, are you, is this a voice recording or who is this? You know, are you a real person? I'm like, yes, I'm a real person. They're like, oh, wow, what are you doing here in a call center? You should be on radio or something like that. And I kept hearing that over and over again. And over time, I just kind of asked myself the question of like, you know, wow, what do I want to do moving forward? So I created what we call the exit strategy. And what I talk to people about is if you are in a place in time right now where you feel a bit like it's not your place or you feel like you want to move on, Don't bash the environment. Find a way to expand beyond that environment. Do what you can where you are, but also investigate what is it that you really wanna do. And I realized I loved talking to people. I loved um, helping people feel better on the phone. And there would be people that would come over to my cubicle and just say, hey, can I sit with you for a minute and just talk? I just feel good when I come into your cubicle and I, you know, I had like little stones and plants up like I do now. <laughs> and they say, hey, we just come over and just hang out with you for a bit. And I realized I had this ability just to make people feel good and, and at work. And so, but I realized I wasn't happy. And it was back in 2018, I took a trip to Italy to get away from everything. I just needed a, a fresh look on stuff. And I got to Italy, I realized that, oh my goodness, 
I need to leave my job. How do I do that? And so those questions came up and I realized that I wasn't happy there because I had grown beyond my environment. So I wanted to leave on good terms. So what I did was I called and said, hey, I'm gonna be leaving in about a year. So I just wanna let you guys know. And I started researching while I was working. I started going to workshops and seminars. I would drive from Seattle to Vancouver, British Columbia, just to, to learn from other people. And I would do this monthly. And what, what it did for me though, is that that last year of working in the call center was actually my best year because it inspired me, it gave me something to look forward to. And that's kind of how the journey started. It started in the call center and I started becoming more aware of like, what is mindset? What is changes? What is challenges? Because in that call center also, we were perplexed with many challenges every day. I would come in and all of a sudden someone would say, hey, we got a clinic that's canceled. You need to reschedule these families. I'm like, what? And we, it was just a lot of tension um, around these things because no family wants to call the hospital. And when they're getting rescheduled, oh my goodness, that's, that's a whole nother battle. And so I had to learn, how do I get my team morale up? So I had to teach my team members how to just, this is what we have to deal with. Either we accept this problem now for what it is, or we resist it. If we resist a problem, resist this challenge, we're not going to do ourselves or the families any good. And so I realized this technique started working on my team members and then we started having great um, results. Uh, I had very little turnovers on my team and I worked in the orthopedics department. So that's the trauma unit, which is a very high turnover rate for that department because there people can be very stressed out when it comes to children with broken bones, concussions. And so you have to kind of have a tough skin to talk to people on the phone who don't see you in person and you're their first outlet. And so it's one of those things where I had to teach my team members, look, you have to step into their shoes and realize, well, how would you feel if you were calling on the other end? So you have to accept this fact that this person is upset. So how do we deal with it? And I realized that that was part of my gift of being able to communicate with my team members that way. And then I just, I left that system there. I taught them how to do it. And I also built a bridge between the call center and the main hospital to show people that we have to communicate on all directions. So that's where my journey began. And when I left the call center, I realized that I wanted to go out to speak. I wanted to go out and to teach people and to work with people directly. And so here I am today. So I just have to circle back to when you told your employer that you were going to be leaving in a year. I think that sometimes, you know, I, as you were saying that, I'm like, oh, I wonder how many people would have just said, okay, you know what, how about now is a good time to leave, right? So it's good that you were able to st stick it out that year. But so many people you hear, they say, I hate my job. I don't like where I am, right? But then they don't know how to get out. Or sometimes they leave prematurely, like, oh, I'm just going to leave and I'll figure yeah. it out. And then it's like, well, you have no income coming in. So it is neat. It, like the exit plan, like you say, it makes so much sense, right? Like you can't just as adults call it a day for the most part, unless if you have somebody who's going to support the other, you know, the other half, but to just plan ahead. Mm -hmm. So even if you have to stay in that job for a year, right? Making, you know, setting up what it is you want to do, how much money you may have to save, all those steps just to be able to get out and move forward. Yeah, you're so right about that. I mean, I, I think that there were so many people that would leave that department and say, I'm going somewhere else. And then literally a month later, I would get a call from them saying, hey, it's, it's the same here. I'm like, is it the same here or is it you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it might be you. So I, and you also mentioned too about me leaving. So I, I believe in keeping good relationships with people. So even when I was there, I realized that I was there because they chose me to be there. Mm -hmm. Now I understand that as we're working on jobs that there are sometimes a dividing uh, line that you just kind of grow apart and that's okay, but it's no sense in leaving people behind and saying, okay, you're on your own. So I was like, look, I'm gonna leave in this amount of time. And I even told them, I said, I will make sure that when I leave, that I will leave things just as, as great as when I came, when they were here. I will make sure that my team members understand why I'm transitioning. That it has nothing to do with any friction. It's more of just me wanting to go into a different journey. So I made very clear that when I left, there was good terms. And to this day, I can still call that call center and get on board and do something with them. And that's why I believe in building with people at that point, you can call them back and say, hey, how are you doing? How are things going? Because that's so important because it's a small world. And I think that some people that they just slam the door and say, I'm done with you. And it's like, but you know what? That person knows somebody that knows somebody. And at some point, you might cross paths again. Mm -hmm. That's so true. 
Yeah, absolutely. You make making me feel bad now. A couple a couple of employers ago, I did give like six weeks notice, and I thought that was kind of a big deal. But then <laughs> talking to you, and you gave a year. <laughs> well, you know, I the the thing is that it was so like last minute for me, and I felt like they didn't see it coming at all. It was just like I think when someone gives a notice, no one sees it coming. But I seemed so happy, but I know deep down inside I wasn't, and I just said, "Hey, I'm going to." And I, I did it more for me too. It wasn't just for them. It was more of like, I need this amount of time to build <laughs> so I can start working on the side gig, get that side hustle going on, get some money coming in, like you were saying, and then, and then transition out and say, okay, now I've got X amount of dollars to survive off of for X amount of months. And now I need to get to work to make this happen. Yeah, and I'm sure that takes, you know, takes away the stress too, right? Especially when you're going into your own business, now being an entrepreneur and that kind of stuff, right? Because yeah, if you don't make the sale, if you don't get it, whatever, then that money is not coming in. Whereas the nine to five, you know, every two weeks you're getting your paycheck, right? So yeah, for sure. It's crazy. Now, I told me I told Brian this last time is that, you know, it is not, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Mm-hmm. I'm going to just go ahead and say this. People are watching and listening today. If you think that, hey, I'm gonna quit my job because I can be an entrepreneur, go ahead and make sure you keep that door open. Because there have been so many times where I've been like, man, maybe I should just go back. And that happens to every person out here. They say it doesn't happen to them, they're, they're lying. It's, it's, it's so tempting to go back, right? But at the same time, you have to have that drive and that mindset that we talked about of just saying that, you know, I'm gonna stay out here. I remember my manager saying, you know, the door is always open. And I joke with her and I say, you know, I I love that, but I will die outside this door. (laughs) (laughs) That's how stubborn I was. I said, hey, I, you know, if, if you leave me that option, I'm just going to take it. I said, but I can't. I said, I have to go with my heart and and figure this out. And it has not been easy. I just want to show this with you guys. It's been a struggle, like building it up and getting to the point where I am today has been, uh, it's a, it's a tough journey, which is why I talk about the journey of things, the process it's like you have to continue to find ways to improve yourself, but more importantly, to get help from people because you cannot do this alone out there. It is, it is the entrepreneurship world, is, it's, it's a tough game. And if you stay with it long enough, get the right help, surround yourself with the right people and continually um, educate yourself on what you need to know, you'll be all right. So can you take us back to once you left and you were out on your own in the big world, that first year, <laughs> what was that process like? What did you have to do for yourself in order for you not to go backwards, right? Well, I'll tell you something. I, I, I'm going to share my secret. And for those who are listening today, don't try it if you, if you haven't planned it out. So I realized that when I was there at that call center for eight years, I said, hmm, I've got some, you know, some funds put away for retirement. I'm going to see if I can tap into this IRA a little bit. So I did tap into it and I said, okay, I want to take out X amount of dollars when I leave because it was mine. Now, of course I had to do that. And when I did that, I realized that I lost money behind it because I was taking it out up front because I only had like a, you know, a couple more years before it could be all mine. So I was like, okay, I'll take it. I'll deal with the cut. And I knew that this was going to last me for a year. So I had to be very strategic about rent, about food, about what I was doing with my, with my money. And it lasted me a full year. So now, it didn't mean that it was easy for me. It just meant that it gave me a little bit of something to work with. Now, for the people that are asking, well, well what if I don't have that kind of income? Well, this is why we talk about side gigs, side hustles. You know, you've got to get that on. You've got to find some kind of work. You know, you got to find some kind of thing that you're doing, that you're good at, that you enjoy doing, that you can make some money on. You know, I'm not promoting anything, but there's a lot of people who go to platforms like Fiverr, mm-hmm. right? They get they get their side hustle on and they make good money doing that or they do other things, you know? So for me, I did voiceovers and I still do them to this day. I mean, you know, I was like, you know what? What am I good at doing? How do I get in this voiceover game? Who do I know? Who can I talk to? And they were like, oh, you need to talk to this person. Okay, great. You know, send me an introductory email and I'll, I'll take care of the rest. And the thing I want to give people today is when someone gives you like that ladder, use it. Mm-hmm use that ladder. If someone gives you help and says, hey, I'm going to connect you with someone, take it on. Don't waste people's time. And I think that for me, I didn't waste people's time. I, when I got help, I made sure that I connected with that person. I made sure that I showed up and I made sure I thanked that person for connecting us. 
And that's kind of how my career has been going from this day on. It's just connections and working with people. One thing you mentioned earlier was empathy. When you were talking about the call center job, you, you know, you didn't use that word, but what you described was empathy, putting yourself in the position of those, of those patients on the other end and, and the parents of those patients and, you know, teaching your team how to do that. Obviously, it's an important thing, but how has empathy played into what you do now? Understanding that it is not about me. It never is. I think this is the big thing that many speakers, you know, I don't consider myself a motivational speaker. I consider myself more of a change maker speaker because I believe that we have to have a personal motive and your personal motive will always dictate what decision you make. I can tell you a thousand great things, but if you don't have the personal motive to want to specifically change something, you're not going to do it. You'll be happy for the moment, like a balloon flating up. You'll be happy, but after a while, when I'm gone, you're going to be like, okay, where's my air? So you got to have that yourself. I think for me, it's always been about serving people, no matter what. And this is what's important. When the money's not coming in and all you're focusing on is like, I want to make the money, you do need money to survive. But what carries you forth is really how you care about people. I was posting on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn for years you know, I was doing that for a very long time. Even when I was in a call center, I wasn't, I didn't have a platform built. I was just creating it. And now people are like, wow, you're still around. You're so consistent. I think it's just doing it for the people and knowing that what you're doing, you're serving people. And that's the empathy. And, and knowing also too, that not everyone is going to have your story. And I think that's the big thing I'm big on. It's like, I'm not going to tell people that I came from this, I came from that. And then you can do this. No, I'm going to ask you, do you want to do this? Because you're coming from a different path than I did, and I'm, I'm driven differently, but I can give you some steps that can help, like, help prevent you from having to take so long. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's just stepping into the other shoes of the person and knowing that that other person that's listening to you, they need you. And you have to provide whatever you can to help them. So it's just understanding that it's not about you. It's about them. So when I'm speaking to people, I'm speaking to that one person doesn't matter if there's 10, 20, 200 people in the room. I'm speaking to that one person that needs me today. Um, I posted something the other day, actually. I did a live video. It was just sporadic. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do a live video on this. And I had someone say, hey, I love when you do live videos. They're so, like, spontaneous. And it's like I was thinking about something the other day, and I was asking for a sign, and here your video is. It popped up. That, to me, means so much. And that's what it's about. It's about helping people become better and literally just like living better lives. We deserve it. So you said, you know, the personal motivation, it's all different. So when, if you're having a one-to-one -one or if you're talking in a big group, how does, if somebody may not know, right, when they're in the situation, how do you pull that out of them? How do they figure out what it is that's motive, that's going to be motivating them? Well, they have to find out first what the problem is. I had this, and I'm gonna use a story here. I had a guy a while back when I first started introducing the step system. So the three steps to the problem is you have to accept, you have to address, and then you have to embrace. It sounds very simple, but I wanna keep things simple for people because I don't believe in reinventing wheels. And I just wanna add a little W40 to it. So I wanted to run smoother. So when we look at something, we have to accept first, what is the problem? And that is hard for people to do because they don't, a lot of people don't want to take responsibility for the fact that they're stuck because of choices. And when we look at what is the actual problem? Okay, I'm not happy here. Why are you not happy here? I don't know. Okay, well, we got to figure that out. Why are you not happy? What's causing you to be unhappy? What makes you happy? So we have to go through this whole flow of like, what is stopping you from accepting your facts right now? And when we accept our facts and we can break through the layer and then start finding the personal motive. Because sometimes our personal motive is to remain stuck because we're actually scared. We don't want change. Because if we change this about ourselves or change that situation, it means that th these relationships may change. It means that this atmosphere may change and we are accustomed to being comfortable. And so the first step is critical, accepting the facts. I think it was Howard Thurman he was a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he said that there is a time we have to all sit ourselves down and have a personal self-confrontation, a civil war, and accept our facts. And that fact is maybe this person doesn't want to change because if they do, they're going to lose this. 
So the first sign of getting them motivated is to accept the fact that there's a problem. That's why I always say, I'm not here to motivate people to just say, hey, you can do it. Because we know that, yeah, you can do it, but why are you not doing it? That's the big question right there. And you have to just accept our facts. And then I move into the, the second step, which it depends on how long the person's willing to accept it. And so I had a gentleman, he had accepted the fact that he, was a, he, he didn't like his job anymore. So he wanted to move into the entrepreneurship world. And I said, okay, why don't you like your job anymore? And it came down to him feeling like he had to be this person in order to support these people. And when I said, okay, so what happens if they tell you that this is okay? He says, well, I would do it. I say, okay, so they're not telling you it's okay. He says, no, they're not really saying that. It's just, I feel like I would let them down. Ah, there we go. You feel like you would let them down. Okay, so have you decided to talk to them about it? And so he sat down with his wife, he had a talk. And she was like, why didn't you come to me earlier about this? And he realized he had the support that he thought he didn't have. And so then he was able to address now his next thing, his fear, and which is failure. He didn't think that he was going to be able to make this work because he didn't have enough money, he didn't have enough time, he didn't have no enough people. So I worked into that second step of addressing that, those problems. And then eventually we moved into embracing. That is taking on the opportunities as they are, no matter what comes your way, if you, you got to take it on and see what happens. And then that three-step process walked him through now and today, he's running a successful business out of Seattle. And I stay in contact with him from time to time. So I have other clients I, that I work with about that. And I even have groups and organizations I talk to because change and challenges, it's a process. It's not just saying, oh, you can change. Because right now that's a buzzword for people because especially with the pandemic, right? <laughs> Everyone wants to change, they want to move forward, they want to pivot. I get it, I hear all those words, but it's more than just words, it's, it, it's an art. It's an art to change. And it's hard because even I, to this day, I have a resistance to unexpected changes because I'm human. So I'm not saying that if I'm talking to you guys now that I'm just void of any type of feeling toward change. No, if someone told me today that, hey, you know what? Um, you're not gonna be able to do this because this happened. I'm gonna be like, what? You know, and I may get down for a bit, but then I realize too that, you know, you, you have to go with the flow. And sometimes the flow is hard. I say that either you can roll with change or be dragged by it. And trust me, the dragging part, it ain't so fun. Well, I think because the reality is it's going to happen anyways, right? So yeah. you can dig your feet in, uh, you know, it, I was thinking even with parenting, right? You dig your feet in, it still has to happen guys, right? But I think the one that stuck out the most was that failure piece, right? Yeah. Because there's so many times, like, <laughs> like even just thinking about the podcast, it's like, oh yeah, you have this great idea and you want to do it. But then it's like, Ooh, how about if it doesn't work out? Or how about if the goals that we have don't play out, but do you just not do it? Do you just not apply to whatever job, you know, pr um, program, what have you just because you don't know. Right. And so it's, it's just that like jumping in also um, with making plans and stuff like that. And just trying, it doesn't hurt to try, I guess. Right doesn't hurt to try. I mean, either like this, this is saying that if you, if you try, if you try, you could fail. And if you don't try, well, you've already failed. Right. You know, you just answered your own question. It's like, yeah, you won't just guarantee the failure right there. So yeah. 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 Trying is, is very hard for people though, because they just don't want to fail. Mm -hmm. I think actually that's, that's funny. That's the best piece of advice I got from my dad. He said, if you, if you don't ask the answers, always no, mm -hmm. right. But same, same principle, but while we're talking about failure, and it's funny because you went the same way I was thinking of going, and I, I wanted to kind of hit in on that. Uh, you know, since you've kind of started on this journey, is there, do you have, is, is going to sound like a weird question, but do you have a favorite failure? Is there something that happened that you, you, you know, it obviously didn't go the way you wanted since we're talking about failure, but you were able to pull something out of that and again, change, pivot, shift, and, and, and get a lesson out of that, out of that failure? Yeah, I remember it's coming to me right now. The very first time I did a, a professional talk, I had the suit and tie on, and I was trying to mimic all the people that I, like, I really enjoyed watching. But I realized that that suit and tie wasn't me. So anyway, I, I did, that was the first failure. I did suit and tie. <laughs> <laughs> so I showed up, and I had someone that set me up with an, a, a group of people to talk to, but I had failed to research this group. Mm. And this was a group of very analytical, like information based people. And I was coming to them with, with this empathetic type of feeling of working in a call center and, 
and communicate with people better. And they were like, what the hell is he talking about? You know, because these are all analysts. And I could see the expressions on their faces when I was talking. And I had to keep pushing through the talk because I just couldn't stop my talk. And then afterwards, they had a feedback session. I'm like, oh man. So they were writing, they were just writing down numbers, writing down everything. I'm like, oh, they probably gave me all kinds of stats on this one. <laughs> so I, I get the feedback. And the person I was with, she said, what happened? I said, what do you mean what happened? I said, I, I did my talk. She says, but yeah, it wasn't the right. I said, I thought you were going to tell me that. And so long story short, was it her failure or was it mine? I think it was more of mine because I should have researched the group. She set me up to be able to talk to them. That was her job to get me in front of them. But it was my job to find out what they were there for. So that was a huge fail. Most embarrassing moment in my life, actually. I think it's probably why I took off the suit and tie after that point. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't wear a suit and tie again, man. But here's the thing. I think that that was my greatest failure was just that moment of not knowing my audience. So from that point on, now I, before I talk to anybody, I want to know what are we talking about? Who's your audience? What do they want? What are their challenges? You know, what do, would you like me to tell your audience? Because once again, it's about serving. Mm -hmm. So if you guys were to say, hey, Adrian, we want you to come and talk to our audience. I would ask you, okay, is there anything your audience is looking for? Is there anything that you want me to talk to your audience about? Because I want to set you up for success. If you invite me and all of a sudden I'm talking about something totally different. You're always going to be like, man, this thing, what is going on? Then that doesn't look good on your behalf. So now my, my greatest lesson learned is to do your research, understand your audience. Who are you talking to? And I will not speak on any topics that I'm not passionate about. I don't care if someone says, hey, we're going to pay you this. I will not speak on it because it has to connect to me heart. That way it goes to my head. I go from heart to head. And that's how I'm able to reach people. So I will no longer just take on something just to say I'm speaking in front of someone. I'm just kind of curious. Did you, ha did you happen to get to see that feedback? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing that stood out to me was great talk, not sure where it was going. <laughs> <laughs> that one hurt. I was like, oh man. And one person said, he's got a nice voice. And that was it. <laughs> and then another person I think wrote down what did he write down? They wrote down, was a bit confused from the beginning. And he kind of lost me at the, at the story. And I'm like, what story? And I'm, I don't remember the story I told her. That talk was so, so the talk was based on the call center, but it wasn't like it is now. Like the way I tell it now is very different than what I told it before, because I didn't know my own story. Mm -hmm. And that's where, how we learn to grow. When we learn how to just basically strategically say, this is what I learned. During that talk, I was like, oh, the call center and this happened, this happened. I was telling multiple stories within one talk, which is what you're not supposed to do. And people are like, well, okay, what story, what point is this? Why is this not connecting? And that was something, that was my very first talk. But I realized that that had to happen. And was I scared after that? Yeah, I was embarrassed. And I was actually mad at the person. But then when I thought about it, I'm like, that's not their fault. <laughs> you know? And then I started thinking about, okay, all right, I got to re-strategize. What is my story? What is my message? And it took me a good three years to develop that core message. It's really interesting. You make me think of a couple of things there. You make me think of, you know, times where I've, I've done public speaking and it hasn't gone well, but it, it, it all reminds me of, uh, I, I don't know if you follow Dave Chappelle at all, but he, I remember <laughs> watching him talk about the first time when he bombed and it was basically a situation he told his mom he was going to do stand up. He's like, but don't tell anybody. And then of course the whole family shows up and he just bombs and he's getting booed and everything. And it's, you know, just, and he's up there thinking, this isn't that bad, right? So, so he, he, he already experienced that like worst possible, that worst case scenario. And he's like, okay, well, if this is the worst that's gonna happen, I'm good <laughs> type of thing, right? It can only get better. It takes that. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts, but it, it really stays with you. And you just never forget. And you just realize that, okay, I had to learn that. And this is the thing, I think Socrates, a great Greek philosopher said that failure is not falling failure is remaining where you have fallen and when we fail at something and we don't get up we don't learn from it we don't want to grow from it then that's you you've accepted failure then but it's still a bitter thing and that's what i like talking about it's like it's not easy and it hurts and i think this is not being talked about enough people say well you know yeah you're failing that's it no let's talk about the other stuff in between mm -hmm. 
like the the symptoms following it, the embarrassment, the letdown, the unwillingness to try again because you don't know if you're going to make it. You know, the 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 second guessing yourself. You know, all this comes up in in the human psyche, and when we don't address that, then we just never go back, and we never uh, improve from it. And you know, it's interesting, like when you say that, right? And then you add in if you are working in a business setting where you have a boss or, you know, it's parent, child, what have you, when you fail, you have that on yourself, but then you also have somebody telling you who's in leadership that you failed. So that person up there would benefit from you (laughs) and you teaching them, how do you address failure with your employee? Right. And that kind of stuff. And how can, yes, you explain to them what's the problem, but again, like, how do you move forward? Because a lot of the times it comes and nobody can see me, but the whole finger waving, right? That's not the way to go because it's going to make that person feel like this. Whereas you already felt like this after your talk, right? You didn't need anybody telling you otherwise. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So speaking like to the person in the leadership role, how do they address failure for an employee? Let's say. Oh, great question. I would say language. You have to use the language of we and us. If you put it on them directly, it is no, no matter what you say, they're gonna take it as them failing, you failing the team. So I would say using the word like we, I would approach it and say, you know, um, I noticed that we have a, a little bit of a problem. I noticed I say we, and that there was a mistake that was made, but I want us to figure this out. And I was good about doing that with my team. I said, I want us to figure this out. And that meant that I was partnering with them. It doesn't mean that I was taking on their problem for them and you're going to erase it for them, but it meant that I was there with them. And I said, you know, let's figure out a way that we can figure this problem out and you let me know what you need to make this happen. And I'm going to work with you on it. And I think it's just a solid approach of how do you talk to a person? And it comes down to to knowing your, your team, the people around you. If you build a good relationship with them in the first place, it will be like a conversation. And that way, when you do have this moment, it's like talking to a sibling or something and say, you know what? I know that you messed up on this, but it's all right. We're going to figure this out. Mm-hmm. You know, you wouldn't tell someone directly that you love that, oh, you suck. Or like, you know, this is, you're, you're, you're horrible, you're a failure. You wouldn't say that. You would just say, you know, how can we figure this out? And I think the language has to be there. I think leadership has to realize too that the people that are working for you are not really working for you. They're working with you. They don't have to work for you. What they're working for is that check, Mm -hmm. is that dollar (laughs) bill. It just so happens they're working with you to get it. (laughs) So when you walk with them in this idea, like this person can leave any moment. They don't don't really need me, but I need them. This is where leadership is really powerful. You need them more than they need you because when they leave, you've got to replace them. And they don't have that headache. So it's like finding a way to connect with the people around you, not saying you have to be super nice and give them what they want, Mm -hmm. but know that they're human. What are their birthdays? Do they have children? What are their children's names? Do they have any siblings? Do they have any special things they like to do? Finding a way to connect. The reason why I stayed at that call center for eight years was because I had one manager. I won't say her last name out of confidentiality, but she was so amazing. And I stayed there because she had a way of connecting with me. She knew how I ticked and she would come by my desk every day. Now she's in a higher echelon of command. She would come by and just, just want to say hi. (laughs) An amazing day. And she would go off to her office and just that little interaction. I was like, man, this is great. You know, I like this, you know, and, and there was one person and he just walked around and he just arms folded and kind of look at people and we were just like, oh no, here he comes. (laughs) (laughs) And when you have that kind of reaction from people, you know something's wrong, but there's gonna be some employees that are gonna find anything to complain about. So from a leadership perspective, it's just looking at it from like, how do I communicate with this person without making it personal, too personal and just talking to them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you will have to address some people that are just not doing their part. I, mean, I had some people on my team, they were just, they were lazy. And I had to address some laziness. And I would say, you know, I need this to be done in order so that I can do this. And I said, can I count on you to do this? And they were like, yeah, I can. I said, well, 
um, what do you need from me to make this happen? Well, I need more time. Okay, great. What can I take off your plate? And that way you can take care of this for me. So it's kind of this dance you have to do sometimes with people to get them to see that you're working with them. But I understand too, if you're in a leadership position and you're watching this, you probably think I got tons of things to do. I got tons of meetings to go to. I ain't got time to be babysitting people. I get that too. But however, these people that you're talking about babysitting, they're actually there to make your business grow. And you gotta make sure they're okay. You gotta make sure they're all right. And when you do have a problem, sit down with them. And in any way possibly make it about us and not about them. And that's how you get through that. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Awesome. Now I want to talk about your, uh, your, your change process and how it applies, you know, to, to real life situations, maybe not even necessarily a work situation. So, you know, if you'll, if you'll entertain this, I, I want to give you this scenario and you'll, you'll be familiar with the scenario. You can actually just correct me where I'm wrong in the scenario, but <laughs> while, while you're going through this, this journey, you know, at some point you end up getting engaged. Uh, you know, you end up finding yourself, you, you, you move in, you find yourself as a stepfather and then a pandemic hits as well. Yeah. So lo- lots of change there. How, how did you apply these principles in, in, in real life to really be successful in, in just in your day-to-day life? I'll be honest with you. And when, it, <laughs> when it initially happened, I was just like, I couldn't use my own words because it's, <laughs> it's so different, right? When you're in the situation and you're trying to, because sometimes you have to just, I would say that, one of the biggest things I made a mistake on, I'll say this because I believe in vulnerability, is that I was unwilling to understand that I could not control my external environment. When you're a leader, you're so used to, to doing things a certain way, but then when you're in an environment where it's not meant to be that way, you can find yourself into a lot of trouble. And uh, I made many mistakes. And I realized that I wasn't accepting the fact that when you're in a relationship with someone, when you're living with someone, you're living with kids, there are all kinds of variables that are going on. And so that was one mistake. I, made. I didn't accept the facts. I was trying to have my own facts. So I had to learn how to just adapt a bit and not try to control everything. So when I did that, I began to loosen up. And here's the funny thing. The kids became more closer to me. Because kids know. Kids spell, no, they, they spell love, T-I-M-E right? And so over time, they began to see more of me and to open up a bit. But I'm not saying I was perfect and I was void of any mistakes, you know, but it's just, I had to accept that I was in this different environment. It wasn't about me. Like I was telling you guys, it wasn't about me, but I walked in thinking that, hey, I'm going to be a super person, you know, and I'm going to do this and do that. And that just wasn't the case. So I had to learn how to accept the fact that I'm not perfect, that I can't make things perfect, that I'm not meant to to control things a certain way. And I had to address my own insecurities, so to speak, of not measuring up enough. And the reason why I'm sharing this is because there's many step parents out there who feel this way. And there's a lot of support groups because when you're stepping, that's why I call it stepping, when you're stepping into something that is unfamiliar to you, that's, that's, that's different, you have to realize that you're not gonna know a lot of stuff. And no parent does actually, mm-hmm. right? Because if there's no manual to it, right? There's just like, you're trying to figure it out along the way. And I think that was my, my issue was trying to just have the manual in hand and be like, okay, I got this. You know, it's like, no, there's no manual. You have to just go with the flow. So I had to accept it, address it, and then I had to embrace the fact that, you know, this is just how it is. And that wasn't easy because nothing's ever easy when you're going through that three-step process, right? So it's just, you know, learning what you don't know. So accepting it. And then, so I had a hard time in the very beginning, very hard time because I had this wall up. It was the emotional wall. It was the unwillingness to open up so that I could give naturally. And it's, you know, during quarantine, we learn a lot about ourselves. The lens that we use to see our world actually gets refocused on us. And then we start realizing, wow, these are patterns. These are patterns I can improve, patterns that I need to correct, patterns that, why am I repeating this pattern? And I think that was something that was very important for us to understand as we work together. It's like, okay, how do we, how do we walk through these changes together? And it was, you know, it was challenging as it is with most people, but at the same time, 
it's it, you can't have, have any change without challenge. You know, if you look at the word challenge, change is inside that word. Mm-hmm. So we you have to go through the challenges in order to make some of the changes. I hope I answered your question, by the way. I think I deviated a bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. <laughs> and I, you know, along comes with everything you just said, negotiating, right? Like you're both coming in to, with your own way of doing everything and, you know, her way of parenting and all that kind of stuff. And just coming in and saying, okay, this isn't working here. This isn't working here. How do we like come together and try to compromise on pretty much every single day situations, right? So that a lot of that back and forth and give and take, I guess you could say, um, definitely a fine dance, a fine line. <laughs> well, I realized I wasn't, I wasn't a, a good as dancer as I thought I was. I had two left people. <laughs> so, so there was a lot of me trying to, I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not how this is done. So I'm like, okay, okay. So it's just, because this is my first time ever parenting. So I was like, okay. I think I got this figured out and I, and I, and I didn't, and I made a lot of mistakes. And the reason why I keep saying mistakes is I want people to know that I'm not this person that's got it all together because nobody does. I think that leaders that are saying they have it all together, it's a false claim because when you want to connect with people, you have to show that you are still trying to figure things out too. I make it talk a lot about success and mindset and business and changes and challenges, but there are some areas I don't know much about. And that was one of those areas. And I had to figure it out. You know, I had to be on my A game. You know, the kids are so brilliant. And you tell them something, all of a sudden, they, you know, two hours later, that's not what you said. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you have to really be like this, you have to be observative. And I think that's the word I want to use. It's like understanding what you're doing. And there have been many moments where I was called out and it's important. I was called out. It's like, look, you know, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't follow through on this. You didn't do this. You know, they want this. You need to do this with them. And I was like, but I did this, you know? And so it's just like, I, I it was like, no, 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 that's not what they want. And there were so many times where I just felt like I was a failure. And because I wasn't living up to the story that was in my head, and this is what I want to get at here, we have to be very cautious of what story we're telling ourselves when it, in regards to our environments because that story can get you in trouble. It can get you into a space where you're disconnecting because you're trying to live this story that's not the story of the environment and you have to learn how to rewrite the story. And so for any parent or any people that are stepping into parenting, and even if you're in a relationship in quarantine, that you have to understand that your story is not someone else's story and that to not make the mistake of sticking to a story that's only yours. And that was a mistake that I made continuously throughout is just sticking to my own story in my head. Because when you're driven and you're trying to do this and do that, you can get lost. You can get like stuck in like, this is my reality, you know? But it's like, no, your reality is the people that you're with. And that reality has to be merged, you know, at some point. So that's, that's the advice I would give people today. It's just don't make the mistakes that I make continuously over and over and over again. You know, it's like, make sure that you're in your environment that you allow yourself also emotional space. So for parents or even partners, give yourself space. Give yourself time to listen to yourself, listen to your own voice, listen to your feelings. Because ideally, what's happening with a lot of people is that we would typically have this separation of going to work or going here or going there. That's not happening as much. Mm -hmm. So now we're in this space where we're constantly kind of rubbing shoulders with each other. And a lot of times what's happening with people, they were saying that quarantine makes or breaks people, right? And for a lot of people that have, that came in with a weak foundation in the first place, they just got rocked with quarantine because then it was like, they're living with someone or with someone. And they're like, oh man, I didn't know this. I didn't know that. Or a lot of things happen. So in quarantine, just get to know yourself more and communicate that with your partner. Um, Get to know your kids more, you know, um, spend more time with them. You know, for the fathers out there, I would say this, you know, I grew up in an environment where my dad wasn't the person that was the cuddler. He wasn't the person that was going to talk to me about all these. My mom was, and my dad was a great father. I love him to this day. You know, he and I can still talk and joke because we had a great relationship, but that was in my mind that I wasn't a nurturer, that I wasn't a person that could sit down and take out time to play a little bit because I was, you know, I got things to do. 
And that was a wake up call for me because it just, it just made me realize that I wasn't um, being there for my partner the way I should have been. And that was what I had to accept my own personal story of thinking that because of this, I have to act this way. And I wasn't willing to address that until there was many conversations like, Hey, um, we need to talk, you know, we need to work, we need to figure out some stuff here. And those conversations are necessary. So those conversations come up, you know, make sure that the people that are watching today have those conversations. Doesn't mean that, you know, things are bad. Doesn't mean that you're going to get in trouble. Just have the conversation because it's important. And um, one mistake that I also made too was I'm not, I wasn't a good listener in the conversation. Like I was waiting to get my two cents in. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if anyone's, you know, watching this or can, can understand what I'm saying. It's like when you're listening to someone, you're just waiting to get your line in and you're not paying attention to what they just previously said. And so you're interpreting what they said as something different because you just want to get your line in when that really wasn't what they, what they meant. And so when you're having these conversations in quarantine, just make sure that you realize that emotions are at, at their highest already. And when someone's talking, let them talk, let them speak. And then I think using the words like, I feel, mm -hmm. instead of you make, you know, if you tell someone, no, you made me angry or you made me feel, no, say, I feel like, like this is what's going on, or this is what I heard. Can you just let me know if I'm incorrect on that. You know, just those simple little like check-ins, you know, and, and just check in with, with your spouse, check in with your partner, check in with your kids, ask them how they're doing, you know, and just um, just let know that the quarantine is going to end at some point. But I think the quarantine is also important for us to really look deeply at ourselves mm -hmm. and find out who we are. I think a lot of people now are, are, are really finding out who they are in quarantine, which is scary because we haven't spent so much alone time, right? So now we're finding out, wow, I do like these things or I didn't like this thing or this person annoys the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're finding out now because typically you would you would have ignored that, right? And so it's like, you know, I'm not saying anyone's annoyed me or anything, I'm just using some examples of like, you know, so it's just important for us to really identify um, our emotions in this, in this quarantine time. So for me, back to our question, um, it was something that I, I knew that I was going to be challenged, but I also, no one is prepared for anything they step into that's, that's different. Neither was my partner, right? So we didn't know that, oh, you no, know, we're going to come together and do this because when we moved in, we didn't know that quarantine was going to happen, right? And like most people, it's just quarantine is, it's tough for everybody. But I think that it drew us closer. Um, we got to know each other more. And we, we also understood our wants and needs more throughout the process. We just began to kind of like, let go a little bit and be like, all right, you're okay in this element, I'm okay in this element. And I think that's just something that's important. So yeah, so for you know, new parents out there too, just, you know, there's no manual. <laughs> and for, <laughs> for step parents, you know, just, uh, how can I say this? Just step in and be yourself, be the person that the person that brought you in wanted, you know, because they obviously chose you for a reason. They obviously trusted to bring you in. So just continue to be that person. I like that. And I guess to add to that, I was thinking to the call out times, right? <laughs> Wait, you know, at the beginning, sometimes in a marriage, I, I'm thinking back to like all those years ago when, you know, things were still so fresh and new you almost feel like if you're going to call somebody out, like it's a bad thing. You don't know how they're going to react. Right. But now like to where we are now, it's actually, it's, it's an example of the fact that somebody feels safe and comfortable enough to share their concerns. Mm -hmm. And once they can let you know, it's up to you on how you want to receive it. Right. Mm -hmm. But being able to say, Hey, you know what? I noticed this is something that you've been doing with the kids, right? Maybe you should, change it this way um and then because sometimes you know for me I, i'm not seeing it that way right mm. so then just being able to have somebody to say that and then it's up to me how i want to receive it and it's up to me how i want to change it right mm. and then also when you have your kids you know my oldest said the other day um you know what did he, 
I don't know why you're mad at me. I didn't do anything. I just gone upstairs, but I was mad at somebody downstairs. Right. And I had to realize, oh, geez, you know what? I'm so sorry in that moment. Like I had to apologize, very vulnerable, very humbling. But also, again, he was comfortable enough to say that and know that my reaction, I wasn't, you know, going to go off or what have you. Right. But it just gives that time for constant change. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause we can't like this, this journey here is just constantly revolving. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I like how you brought that up to the, the call out and yeah. <laughs> because I think my, my partner, she said that, um, <laughs> she said the honeymoon phase is over. It's like, this is, this is, <laughs> so, cause uh, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things where I think that, you know, and, and I'll be honest again too, the call out is I, I had a problem with that because I didn't, there's parts of me that felt like I was, um, not perfect right and that's the whole thing again right going back to if someone calls you out your your partner your spouse your friend whoever you're living with you have to look at it like okay this is what's being said and as you mentioned like how do I want to interpret it mm-hmm. you know how do I want to uh change you know dealing with this information I've received and my partner always said that she said I can't I don't want you to change because of what I'm saying I want you to change because you want to change and you and you of these reasons i think it falls back to the, the terminology i use it's like change is something that it has to be um on the end of you wanting it that personal motive of why are you doing it in the first place and i think that right now change has been something that's happened through with all of us through the pandemic because it's kind of put us into a position where we have to look at things differently we have to listen to things differently and we have to like you mentioned be more patient right we Sometimes we can take this thing that we emotionally has set us off and we take it with us like baggage, right? We go to someone else when we're just like, you know, you know, don't test me. You know, it's like, I don't go there. And it's like, well, where is this coming from? It's coming from something else. And I think that's something that I think people are just frustrated too right now. It's a lot of tension. I think people that are watching just be easy on the tension because a lot of your frustrations is not toward the people directly in your environments because you're frustrated with your inability to be able to do the things you typically would want to do because of the lack of resources that are available to us right now. So it's like, what can you create at home that will give you a sense of tranquility? Like what space, maybe it's listening to music. You know, if, you, if you're like me and you like you no know, uh, vinyl records, you know, maybe sit down and be like, oh, I'm gonna go through my vinyl record collection here and then listen to some stuff. You know, if you like, a reading, you know, what books do you have? What book have you haven't read before? Maybe gardening, maybe painting, you know, re-identifying back with what makes you happy. Because I believe that we're leaning on a lot of people too much to make us happy. And when we do that, we actually end up falling down because they're not meant to keep us up that way. You have to add value to other people. And more importantly, you have to add to their happiness and they add to yours. But you are responsible for your own happiness. I think it was Abraham Lincoln. He said that, a uh, person is about as happy as they make up their minds to be. Mm-hmm. And it's like we we have to understand that emotionally we are we are biologically driven to have emotions, which are just energy emotion. And we're going to have a variation of these throughout the day because it's just called, you know, navigating through life. The key is identifying more with the emotions that make you happy, what things trigger that and getting back to that for right now, finding out what makes you what, what things you like to do. That's just sitting and being quiet. Communicate that with your spouse, your partner, your friends. Say, hey, you know what? I just like to have a little time alone today. And they say, well, what did I do? Because some people will say that, right? What did I do? <laughs> what did you do? You were around me all day. <laughs> just kidding. No, but that's the thing. You know, they'll, they'll, some people will say, well, what did I do? You know, or, or, or through. And I think that communicating that, like my partner now, we, we communicate that. Like, you no, know, she'll just say, hey, I'm going on a drive. I'm going out here. I'm going to do that. And I just say, okay, cool. Great. You know, um, but it's like, if you don't communicate what you need, then then that's going to lead to a lot of mistakes. And that's one thing that I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. Um, I was just not open. And I want to get back to that again about uh, being vulnerable. And I think a lot of, I mean, not making excuses for, for genders, but a lot of men have this problem of, being more open. And a lot of it is coming from conditioning and and some and, and people in general. Some people just have a problem being open. And I think that with quarantine, when you're with someone, you have to work out the things that are keeping you closed off. 
what is it that's causing you to keep a wall up? Because I kept a wall up for a long time. And that wall, you know, honestly, I'm, it's, it created some damage. Because emotionally, when you keep a wall up, you can't give out love and neither can you receive it. And I think that right now, whether, you know, you can be great in business, but you can suck in relationships, right? <laughs> so, so I'm talking to you guys right now. It's like, no, I don't suck in business and suck in speaking, but I was not, um, how can I say that? I was not on point with relationship. And I think that's something that I wanted to share today. It's just that no one's perfect. And even with me, I'm learning to, to make changes and learning of what didn't work, the mistakes I made and how to go forward from that. But do I consider myself a failure? Absolutely not. I just feel like I there's things that I could have done better, right? I could have I could have you know been better at, and this just comes with process of time of growth and change. Yeah, and you you brought up a, a lot of good points there, and you actually alluded to that earlier as well. So I'm glad you brought it up again. It makes me think of Shaquille O'Neal because our kids wanted to watch Kazam the other day. <laughs> it's like you know knowing what you're good at and what you're not. He's a fantastic basketball player at the, you know, the prime of his career, but he wasn't a great rapper or, or actor, right? So <laughs> there was a lot of, there's a lot of uh, poor quality movies and CDs that came out during that time. It, it sure did. <laughs> <laughs> I remember his video game he came out, it was on Sega Genesis, he had a video game, I think. I was like, kid, I got that video game, that, that sucks too. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> I think I'm just gonna skip with the basketball watching. <laughs> oh man. But but it, but it speaks to your point though. You like you don't have to be good at everything, and sometimes you just need to take a step back and see. Okay, maybe this isn't the piece for me. I know a lot of leaders struggle with that. When I when I was able to get over that, I was I became very strategic and surrounded myself with people who liked the things either that I wasn't good at or didn't like, <laughs> and it, it just makes life so much easier. And you you know you get you, you have with with all these different skills, you have to have a certain level of competence. But some things are just not going to be your strength, and it's just understanding that. Yeah. Yeah, you're human. You know, we're on this planet and it's like we're all trying. I think there were, we're here to do three things as humans. We're here to learn, to grow, and to fully express ourselves. The learning part is okay. The growing part's hard because it means you have to learn what didn't work and learn from the mistakes. This is what I mean by growing forward. We grow forward when we take what we what didn't work for us and we understand it didn't work or with the mistakes we made and we learn to take those forward with us so that we don't make those mistakes again. And this is how we grow forward. So it's not just go forward, you gotta grow forward. You know, Because I believe that you just can't just go forward and, and not realize where you're going or what you're doing along the way. And he, many people do this, they just go straight on and like, you see the mess you're making back here? Like all this stuff you're leaving behind, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, it's like, you gotta pick all this up and take it with you so that other people don't get affected by it. You know, it's like taking, take it with you and figure out what you're gonna do with it as you go forward. And then that third thing is expressing yourself. Now, this is the hard one. I think right now with quarantine, people are realizing, all right, I wanna do something different. I didn't realize that I like being home. I like this space, I like, spending more time, you know, in these areas. So now is the time to start learning about expressing yourself, like getting back to enthusiasm. What is it that you like to do and how can you do more of it? You know, and if you say that you don't have enough time, then we, we all got time. We got 24 hours in a day. You know, the only difference is a person, people who understand that and they understand what to do with the time, you know, it's, it's not guaranteed, but we all have 24 hours in a day. So you gotta sit down at some point and just ask yourself, you know, what do I like to do? What do I wanna do? And go on a walk go outside, you know, if you need a break, you know, tag team, you know, you know. <laughs> I always had this, <laughs> always had this joke when I, when I first moved in, I was like, man, kids do not understand social distancing at all. <laughs> and we still joke about it to this day. Cause you know, it's just one of those jokes we had. And it's just like, but if you're, um, you know, partnership with someone just tag team and just say, okay, Hey, I need to have a few moments you know, to do these things. Can you do this for me? Can you watch out for this for me? And if you need to get a getaway, just say you're going to the car to get something. This is what we usually do. We just say, don't say you're going to the store. <laughs> because because my, my um, partner, she has a six and four year old. And when she says the word store, or if we, if I say the word store, then they want to go on at it. Yeah. So now it's just like this saying, like, just go to the car so you're getting something and then just take off. <laughs> <laughs> We got to start with that one because the same. Yeah, it, it, it works. 
it works. And what happens after about a few hours, though? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my best, my best friend and I used to do that because he he would always have to take his brother and sister everywhere he went, or you know, oftentimes take one of them. So if they asked, so when they saw us leaving, or if they if we were about to leave, what we started doing was we play hide and seek with them, and then we just wouldn't go find them, and we go <laughs> do what we were doing. Uh, probably not a great example, but it worked. It worked at the time when we were thirteen and fourteen years old. Oh, it was so funny because we would do that. And, and then um, the six year old would say, well, it's getting dark. Where's mommy? And I'm like, oh, she's going to be back in just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> she's fine. She's safe. Fine. She's actually going to be even better when she gets home. <laughs> she's on her way. You know, oh, so, It's just the little things that you do that can help each other out. You know, the partnership and that and just uh, finding ways to, to listen to the other person. Mm-hmm. And I can just say, listen to the person that's next to you. Listen to them. And, and every now and then ask them, you know, is there anything that you need? Just ask that, that, that phrase means a lot. Is there anything that you need? Is there anything that I can do? You know, and I think be careful with the fix it hat because I, I wear it a lot. I want to fix things. And that's how you get in trouble real fast. Mm-hmm. Some things are not meant to be fixed. Mm-hmm. Some people just want to be hurt. You know, I've made so many mistakes in quarantine. Like, okay, I can, how can I, well, what can I do? She's just like, you don't get it. I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen to me. I'm like, okay, I'm listening. And as I'm listening, I'm trying to fix it. <laughs> so it's just a vulnerability of just like, you know, just knowing that, hey, you know, we're all human, I'm human. And then I just let people know that this is this is what it's about. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm okay with sharing these stories because I know that this is part of my life and I'm not afraid to say that. So it was like, do I, do, am I, do I suck at parenting? I wouldn't say I suck at parenting. I wouldn't say that. Am I am I a class at it? No, not by any means. Oh, speaking of A letters, I woke up one morning and I went to my desk. I think I was having a pretty good morning. And I, I picked up a piece of paper. I'm like, what the heck? What is this? And there was this piece of paper on my desk and it had an F plus, 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 plus. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is not, this is not, a, this is a bad note to start my day off. Like, I'm like, what is going on? And I, and apparently the six-year-old gave me a grade. This was when I first moved in. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So it's just those funny experiences. You're just like, wow. Okay. Do I really suck? <laughs> yeah. But it's just, it's just part of the journey. It's, it's so fun. And it's just, it's just funny to have those stories. Well, you know what they say, an F plus is a dreamer's D minus. So you're still, you're pretty much right out of pass. So <laughs> I held on to that note that whole day. I never had a note bother me so much. And I was like, how do I turn this into like a, a B or something? Like, what did I do? What happened yesterday? Yeah. Then, yeah. And then you start thinking, what in the world? Where's this coming from? He was waiting for me at like seven o'clock in the morning. I'm like, okay, this, this had to happen yesterday then. And it was like, on this <laughs> oh man oh man parenting <laughs> all right adrian uh, you know in, in terms of uh, talking about learning or you know in your case teaching <laughs> expressing yourself what are you up to these days where can we find you what can we look forward to from you in the coming months oh there's so much i got going on right now so you can find me on social media pretty much everywhere i'm on instagram linkedin facebook twitter just type in adrian starks in google you'll find me um, I would say right now I'm working on a book that I have that's coming out this year. And it's a book, it's a compilation of, there's another side of me that people don't know about, the poetical side. So before I started doing professional speaking, I actually was doing uh, spoken word poetry throughout Seattle. Mm. And so I wanted to show up in this arena and say, you know what, I don't want just the book on telling people how to be successful because we've got a lot of those books. I want a book on expression, on showing people that leaders have the ability to be artistic and expressive in their own ways. And I wanted this to be a way of showing people how to show up in their own authentic way. So this book will be coming out probably in the next few months, and it's going to have success pieces in there, stories, more stories that I'll be sharing, uh, tap dancing stories. You guys don't know about that, but I'm a tap dancer. So I have a lot of stories from a mentor. I learned about tap dancing, how to communicate, and I use that and how I communicate with people. And so this book will be coming out. I'm also working on um, actually a podcast course to teach people about the power of podcasting and how that works. And yeah, I got a lot of speaking gigs coming up in the next few months and just, yeah, pushing forward, growing forward and just creating things out there. I just want people to understand 
and I'll be courageous creators and create your own opportunities. Awesome stuff. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Adrian. Really thank enjoyed this conversation today. Yeah, it was good. It was been great. It was been fun. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday. Thank <laughs> you.